Welcome to Parallel Lives. This is episode four of the podcast, and the topic today will be triggers. I'm Dimmer, and this is our co-host Levi. Hello. Today, our guests are Q, 20-year-old American, Amelia, 20-year-old college student, and Meg, a 25-year-old who works in tech support in London. And I, um, I think we should probably say what we mean by triggers, because um, MD is kind of associated with trauma. So we're not talking just about trauma triggers, in, in case anybody thought that's what that epi- this episode was about. We're going to be talking about triggers more as, hmm, I don't know, what's a way to describe it? Not inspiration, but maybe like a... I'd say it's a moment in time or something that causes you to sort of drift into your uh, your paracosm or your your daydream, your world of daydreams. At least that's what it is for me, although I'm more of an immersive daydreamer most of the time than I am a maladaptive daydreamer. So that's how I would describe it. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good description. Kind of like a, a, a catalyst for the urge, maybe. It's a, it, it opens the doorway to which, uh, the doorway to Narnia, I suppose. You hit a point in, in your day, or multiple times a day, which the door opens up for you and you say, man, that sounds like a good place to be. And then you open it and suddenly several hours have passed and you wonder where you are, who you are. Yeah. I think the way I've often felt it as well is it, it's, it sometimes feels like the difference between being in a pool and like standing with the water like up to your waist and then having the water over your head. I think often is how it can feel for me in terms of like the difference in, in immersion, I suppose. I've always described it with water too, um, but <laughs> I always went with like drowning, like you're trying to fight to the surface, but it keeps pulling you down. Mm. I've always thought of it as um, like dominoes or like um, a similar effect as, as dominoes would be like, like a chain reaction where there's an initial, an, an initial, I guess, a trigger or an initial catalyst, like you said before. And then it just kind of, one on top of the other, all kind of falls into place. Mm -hmm. And I I think there's different types of triggers, right? Well, I mean, there's different types of triggers, um, but the kinds I'm thinking of, or or there's, I think there's several where you could say they're, they're not necessarily wanted. They just kind of, they come and, and they, they pull you in. And you, you don't really want to. There's a word for that. I can't remember it. And then there's those where, at least for myself, I feel very tempted to just b- to, to generate a trigger all on its own. Because music is, is my primary trigger. So there's some times where I'm just like, I say to myself, you know, some music would be good right about now. And I know it's a terrible idea because then I lose an hour of my day right then and there. But I still want to do it. And then there's other times where I just... Like when I'm doing homework and I've done it for a long time, I I just drift off unwarranted and I I don't really have a choice. Music is also a major trigger for me as well. Music is such a big one for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. What are your s- strongest triggers? Um, you know, music is a big one for for mo- a lot of people, but um, as far as other things go, you know, what what else is really strong? Well, even without music there's times to which i say i i I go throughout my day and and something goes on during my day uh the world that you generate in your daydreams there's things that you could easily uh, incorporate into your paracosm so when i see something or experience something during my day that i can say wow this would work well in this world that i've created then that sort of pulls you in in and of itself let's say you have an interaction with someone that you could easily see your characters going through that's where you're like man how could i incorporate this and in some cases you could incorporate it very easily and then there goes your day yeah I completely agree with that I think for me as well um it's often when um, I have I guess very much related to that when I have a specific life event happen to me personally and I don't um if I don't have someone to kind of process that with in the moment or I don't feel like there's someone who who could perhaps fully empathize with what I'm going through in that moment my my impulse is to then bring it into into that 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 into sort of my paracosm into that other world where I can I can bounce around those ideas with um with my own characters who I can sort of gener- generate that empathy from. I think empathy is also a really big one because then if you don't have someone to empathize with, you sort of need a uh, uh, people often call it an escape. I think it's more of something where 
you know, something in your life that you need to internalize. Let's say, oh, Lord, I'm, I'm sure you all have dealt with customer service in one way or another, right? And you need to you need to decompress in some way, but you're at work and you have no time to do so. And it's just one of those, an easy way to do it was to take that beautifully kind person that you've dealt just dealt with who's been screaming at you for several minutes and then you take them put them inside your paracosm and then stick them in a scenario to which it's not very kind to them but it's a good way to decompress all the same so because you can't really you don't have the time to to vent to somebody else perhaps i've found um two major types of triggers i guess each kind of with a different like there's one that is i guess i would say a a positive trigger it's not really the right word but um it's like an inspiration a moment of inspiration something to incorporate into the paracosm and then there's i guess the negative trigger where something really boring or aversive is going on in like the real world so you escape into the paracosm either out of boredom or yeah like like somebody's somebody's being difficult and you don't really want to deal with the real world right now so you kind of slip away into your own world you know as a as a way to decompress or to alleviate trauma you said something super interesting and that was a uh, boredom right because mm -hmm. there seems there's a lot of moments during uh the day where i think a lot of people can sympathize where you just have nothing to do so instead i, I think a lot of people might uh, turn to say twitter or 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 some social media platform or they start reading things but uh when you're bored during the day for a for a maladaptive daydreamer or an immersive daydreamer it's super easy to just say there is nothing going on but you know where something is going on it would be inside of my uh my paracosm my world because you would have let's say 30 minutes um to where you could just daydream that 30 minutes away the the problem comes from when that 30 minutes bleeds over into the time where you shouldn't be daydreaming, but you are. Exactly. I think um, just based on that as well, um, for that very reason, one of my strongest triggers is long journeys. So if I'm on a bus or a plane or a train going somewhere and I'm on that for a couple of hours, that's, that's that tends to be prime daydreaming time for me because it is just this long period of nothingness. Yep, driving is a big one for me because then music just tends to come on. I, I have a playlist or two and I just daydream while I drive, to which you might say, oh, that seems like a problem. And I would say yes, but I've been doing it for so long. And I, I drive carefully enough to wear. And I, I do that daily as my work. So that's when I daydream the most. So it's it, I can sympathize with that because there really is nothing going on. You get from point A to point B. You're bored. You have nothing to do. And you're tend to have music on even if you don't have music on my mind tends to wander so that becomes an issue as well i empathize with the car riding and driving as well because yeah um that was where even as a kid i did most of my daydreaming was because because my family like we we travel a lot so that was kind of a very big part of my childhood was riding in cars and daydreaming you stick in some earphones or earbuds yep. and that's it. Yep, 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 that's what I did. Even when you would have, uh, and it doesn't even need to be that long, right? We would go mm -hmm. down the road and it'd be 60 seconds. But you, you exactly. pick a song and you just daydream the 60 seconds and then you're already in it. Mm -hmm. I guess a kind of unfortunate side effect of that, of the riding in cars being so, um, so big of a trigger. I don't actually know how to drive yet and I'm honestly kind of scared of learning to drive um i've that's kind of why i've been hesitating for so long because it's so easy for me to slip into this other headspace and like i i'd say i'm i am a maladaptive daydreamer but when i'm really into it it's very immersive like i can't i don't feel i wouldn't feel safe right like driving a car going back way way back to uh to the answers to the first question about what was your strongest triggers right why do you think that these are the strongest triggers for you personally? I, the reason that my strongest trigger is music, I, I suppose it's just because I have always have liked soundtracks and music is a spectacular way to put a soundtrack behind uh, the story that you write inside of your daydreams. And that's a big one for everybody. But the one personally for me 
uh, the reason that I take real world events and then place them inside of my daydreams is because, well, I never really had an outlet growing up. I, I didn't have anyone, I didn't have many friends. I didn't have anyone to speak to. It was just me and, uh, my daydreams. So I use that as a means to, I suppose, uh, inter it would be to internalize everything that was happening to me as a coping mechanism, but also, uh, to see like if I had, if I took a portion of myself, right? I think we, we all do that. We take portions of ourselves and split them up and turn them into characters inside of our paracosm. I wanted to see what they would say about, let's say someone's bullying you. What would each of them do if they were presented with that, that bully, right? And that's a means of exploring how your inner self, perhaps, but it was also a, a spectacular coping mechanism because you have nowhere else to turn to. I didn't, anyways. So that's why it was that for me definitely got a couple of points on this one as well for for myself so I think for me um I don't think I mentioned this when we were discussing the first question about what our triggers are but I know a, a big one for me is um whether that whether it's in a film or a podcast or a um a, a book um specific moments between characters and specific moments of dialogue can really like draw me in um and I often feel I think we um I think Dr. Q, you'd mentioned this before, this sort of taking that mm -hmm. from um, whatever, you know, wherever you've read it or wherever you've seen it and, and putting that in your own world. Um, and that for me combined with music um, has a really powerful effect. And I think that's because often what I feel like I'm trying to do in my daydreams is um, recreate some kind of, a, of an emotion, like a strong emotion in myself. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like I can, I can do that through very specific interactions between characters, creating the right kind of mood, like you were saying with the music, you know, creating that that atmosphere almost. Um, and and then using that as a way to sort of draw out those emotions in your characters and kind of, I don't know, I almost feel like I'm I'm feeding off those emotions that, that those characters are feeling. Um, and I can I can replay that one scene over and over again, just like recarving it, like perfecting it almost in my mind to until it's this 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 sort of perfect sense of this emotion that I'm trying to recreate. I think emotion has come up a few times with you guys. There's well, at least in my life there are several things that I lack. Let me use a metaphor in this case. Diamonds are made when you put carbon under an extreme amount of pressure and an extreme amount of heat for a very 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 long time I, everyone's a bit of carbon right and you know you you could be coal or anything else carbon can be almost anything but i w had been put inside of this pressure this heat for so long that i i've turned into a very hardened cynical person um i only remember throughout the entirety of my years which is about 20 that there is only one time in my entire life that I have been happy. And that did not come from my family. It only came from my friends and it only came once. So my entire life, I've been a relatively hardened analytical person. Um, I'm not, I've never been tr like really happy. So my, for me specifically, the thing that I lack is, uh, is warmth uh, emotionally. So I use that as a means to, uh, I, I try to explore, I try to grab that. It's like Quicksilver or a Mercury, I guess. I try to grab it in my daydreams all the time. It's just this thing that I lack and I keep trying and trying and trying. Um, so just every single, as an emotion, right? Because uh, uh, Meg was talking about emotions that you, you desire, right? And so there's that warmth that I just cannot grab. So that I think is a driving force in my in my uh, daydreams i've i've tr i've been doing it for years and i've been trying to gr find it for years and i'm i'm it's one of these things where that is a, a it was in the past the sole driver of my daydreams um of course it had become twisted and warped over time and almost every time i tried to grab it very much like mercury you can't grab mercury it will simply fly out of your hands if you grasp it too hard but that's that would be an emotion you might try to find and for some people there's just you can't there's some things that you lack so heavily that it almost can become an obsession for some people and sometimes in, in several cases it does do because you can't just tell them to stop daydreaming it's like depriving them of something i believe in the chat they said have you ever tried to intentionally remove triggers it's very much like an addiction right 
if you if you deprive someone of something for so long, like like a trigger perhaps or an emotion, and you just they 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 need it, right? It is something you desire so heavily. There's you just can't stop, right? It, that'll drive you until until the moment you're gone. Yeah, I I empathize with what you were saying about um being unable to grasp that in the real world. So you live almost by vic- you almost live vicariously through your characters Mm -hmm. by creating Mm -hmm. this world so you can experience that for yourself because i mean some people some people they have that stuff in the real world and they still kind of daydream because it's not just like oh i'm unfulfilled so i do this thing it's it's deeper than that Mm -hmm. but i think for a lot of people including myself it comes from a some kind of deep-seated desire yeah like something that yeah you can't you can't get in your daily life or something that was deprived of you for me it it's for me it kind of stems from i think isolation and why these things are like kind of a really strong pull for me because you know why try to make friends in the real world when i can just make my own you know in in a way um mm-hmm. you know and just do that kind of stuff cuz um as a kid i I didn't have a lot of friends either. I, you know, I don't really think I had hardly any friends. Um, I spent most of my time at home and uh, by myself, basically. I spent a lot of time by myself. So I, I think part of, yeah, part of the, part of why these things are so strong is because it, it, you don't feel alone. Like, like, um, the, uh, the boredom trigger. That one is especially strong for me because I spend almost all my time alone and bored, you know, like I don't, well, I I don't mean when I daydream, I'm not bored, but, um, but that's something you can get that you can't get in the real world. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Like I, yeah. Like you could, like, I feel like I want to, I feel like I could be put just about anywhere in the world and I would be able to, I guess, entertain myself, like keep myself entertained because I can daydream, you know, like I don't, Yeah. it doesn't matter where I am. Um, I feel the same way. Yeah. yeah, but it does come at a cost, you know. It always does, but that's yeah. very interesting, right? Um, like you being anywhere and being able to generate your own entertainment, right? Uh, I think there's plenty of people who don't have to deal, well, who don't have to deal with maladaptive daydreaming or or daydreaming to this extent. Often find, uh, they find entertainment in other ways and in other places, but because we can do it almost anywhere, it, mm-hmm. it, it's one of these things where I guess you don't really need much right it doesn't take much to to generate that sort of entertainment for yourself right which is why triggers can so easily come to you also the cost is huge the cost yeah. is so large because you can't stop it's an addiction right it's i think it's similar to social media right but yeah. social media you can see people go overboard with mm-hmm. daydreaming this can't. is slightly off topic but um just this morning um my knees were like actually like super hurting um to the point where like i was having trouble sleeping because i like i was pacing a whole bunch and it's like it's actually the cost is huge (laughs) yeah it's it's causing physical problems i think that leads really well into what actually happens to you when you're triggered what does it feel like what is it make you do um internally and externally like you you mentioned pacing is very common i have to watch for my facial expressions as well especially if i'm in public because they will go i will start you know either if it's if i'm if it's like quite a positive conversation that's going on in my head i will start grinning um like i'll start mouthing the words that i that are that are happening in the conversation and I've definitely caught myself you know if I've been walking down the street and I've walked past someone and I've just said a word out loud from the conversation and gone oh I I wonder if they heard that that would have sounded really odd out of context yeah I I can empathize with that one um my family kind of makes fun of me for stuff like that every once in a while like if I if I kind of slip away a little bit I'll sometimes make some weird facial expressions depending on what scene is being acted out um I pace a lot because I, I daydream a lot. And, and I think part of it is also the musical component. Like I like the, um, the, like the sound, it's almost like a dance, I guess, the way that I do it, it has like a certain cadence to it. So I pace a lot and that 
really puts a strain on my legs and stuff and my muscles. My feet as well. Oh gosh. Um, my feet are always sore. I guess I'm trying to think of some more uh, psychological like effects of what happens when when like when the trigger first occurs. The words aren't really coming to me yet. It might be it might be similar to just like a like a switch is flipped on. Right. Yeah. Like a switch is flipped on and then the world the world no longer exists. Your world does, but the, the real world does not. What are some physical costs for me? Usually it's not that bad. Like I don't pace. I'm not a pacer. Most people are. I am not. Uh, but what does happen is if I, I lay in my bed and I, I, I sit still or well lay down still, the problem is then you become a little bit too sedentary. I know I was back when I was a maladaptive daydreamer. And then I changed my medication. I lowered it a bit and it became a little easier to function. But back when I only daydreamed, it became a problem because I was so sedentary, I would become sore from laying down in bed and not moving for such long periods of time. But if I hit a climax in the story, perhaps I'm listening to a very high octane music, I think is what you might call it. Or, I, or it's like, say, a fight scene or it's a massive battle. And then the two, the hero and the villain are, are dueling it out. And then one gets the final blow. Like it's a, it's like a shot of adrenaline, right? And then I, it's not like convulsion. I don't think it's like I, I like, I like jump out out of bed. Not literally jump, but like I sit up out of bed incredibly quickly. So when I ended up having uh, surgery, and I, I couldn't use my abdominal muscles. I, I fell into a daydream, and then I did that. And I'm, I'm, I will tell you right now, that was not the thing to do. Because I should not have been using my, my abdominal muscles. And when I did, it was very, very painful. I was not very happy for the next day or so afterwards. But that's a problem that might arise. If you are not, if you can't, like, let's say you're a pacer like yourself, um, you, like yourselves. And you are just not supposed to be walking. You're not supposed to be moving. Then you, then you, you get this itch, this urge to do so and that's once again you're being deprived of that and it becomes you you, you get that i think is when you get the, the psychological effects is when you can't daydream or your your normal triggers are being taken from you forcefully mm -hmm. then you sort of begin to to get that itch that you can't quite scratch if that makes sense does that make sense i think that makes sense no it, it does and and i think that I think that's a really interesting point and it, it reminds me of something that I've definitely felt in the past when I have been um I guess taken out of that 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 very intense immersion period of my daydreaming either too soon or I've I've been trying particularly hard to um I guess fight against the impulse I'm I'm often left with this feeling of um I guess it's a it's a it's a very specific flavor of anxiety where you just sort of feel like you don't quite have the like your skin suddenly feels very thin on like an yes. emotional level and it's like you don't quite ha you don't quite know how you're going to put up with the rest of the day <laughs> if that makes it or just in general life just suddenly feels very overbearing um is is often a feeling that I've had and and, and I think um what you were saying Dr Q uh, linking it to um linking it to that idea of um what you were saying about that ability not to daydream mm -hmm. uh, in in particular moments and like the consequences of that so um yeah i guess when that i guess that sort of mode of protection almost is kind of taken from you um for whatever reason like that there it's it, it it can be very stressful because suddenly you feel like this normal mechanism you have for 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 coping with certain situations isn't there anymore um, I think it's it's one of these things where I I read online somebody was uh, talking on a post I don't know where it was Tumblr Twitter they were talking about they said um, are you gonna let a bad vibe carry you through the day and they were talking and there was a discussion on uh, mental fortitude and and trying to keep your yourself in a good mood um, and uh, when you, when you have maladaptive daydreaming or immersive daydreaming and it is suddenly ripped from you because especially it's like watching a movie right or reading a story and you found yourself so immersed and someone just turns the television off that would probably make you very upset it's it's just such a a, a fast and abrupt switch that literally generates the very vibe that ruins your day and it often carries and sometimes it carries throughout several days because they'll it, 
sometimes they do it over and over and over to which you say, oh no, this person is going to immediately, the moment I see them, ruin my daydream. So then you start to avoid them, right? But that becomes more of a, like, uh, like Shadow said, that's like a behavioral addiction, right? They t that's how you tend to act when, like, uh, when faced with that situation and you have an addiction to like social media or whatever. I think um, a couple times some of my family members even threatened to uh, remove the door to my room because I spent so much time in there. Um, you know, little things like that. My family removed the lock from the doors. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yeah. No more locks. Um, I wasn't allowed to go to bed until 7 p.m. Yep. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And then they would say the the families, and it's like I couldn't explain this to my family to where because I would tell them I'd say I'm just daydreaming. Could you please leave me to daydream? And they're like, you mm, no. So then you're in a I was in a position, and I'm sure you're in a position too, Amelia and and Meg as well, and Dimmer Levi. I'm sure all of you have been in a similar position where your family you're trying to explain to them that, and they don't understand, and they don't even acknowledge it most of the time. And so you are you are becoming less you are becoming farther from your family, and this is causing a schism, which is a problem. And, and does it lie in the maladaptive daydreaming? Does it lie in their lack of open mindedness? Who knows? I, I think it goes on a case by case basis. But now, because you are not being understood, you you want to be farther from your family, which makes it worse. It's a cycle. It's that circle. It, it's, it's it's tormenting. It's a, it's a it's just mm -hmm. downward and downward and downward. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure you would be able to break it if you could find someone who understood. But since this is such a misunderstood phenomenon that, yeah. that many people don't understand it other than others that are dealing with it. Right. And that's why you mm -hmm. could, that's where you would end up finding such a community like ours. Something that I've noticed, and I'm, I'm not sure if this was um, covered yet, but um, once, once the trigger happens for me, it is very hard to, suppress it um mm. until i until i pace until i fully actualize the idea so uh, i remember um i guess an anecdote um for school because i would always pace after school i, I used to ride my bike that was, I, I used to not pace i would ride my bike and i would be triggered almost like like it, it would be inevitable i would get triggered at school at some point from something because I, I love to learn and I love to incorporate things that I learn into my daydreams. So that was like a, like school is basically just how to get triggered 101. Um, <laughs> um, so I would get triggered at school and then I wouldn't be able to focus on anything for the rest of the day because I would be waiting to get home so I could ride my bike. Or um, I think even a couple times, I had skipped classes to walk. So that was a big problem later on is that I would I eventually got it into my mind that like oh I I don't have to wait, I can just leave and and walk. Um and that caused a lot of problems for me because I just I could not focus and I was like maybe it's better if I just get get it over with now and come back and try to learn some more rather than just sit there um basically just looking like a zombie because i'm just trying to focus but i just can't it's like a haze you know it's like a it's like a fog in your mind um because you're just you're, tr you're you're slipping away and you have to just try to stay in that moment in the moment and it's a bit of a false promise isn't it like that sense of oh if i just if i just get through it if i just focus on 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 whatever whatever part of this daydream I need to focus on. If I just do that, then I can go back to what I was doing. But I, I don't know about you guys, but I found in my experience that fog you were talking about, that sort of limbo state between not quite focusing on your daydream, but also not quite focusing on the life in front of you doesn't really go away. Yeah. Like once that impulse is there, you're sort of stuck in between the two until you decide which way you go and the decision is normally to 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 go inward i think it's so frustrating and then then someone might say it's like well th then then you said it yourself it's like well then just just go pace and walk and then well then you can come back and be focused and then you so you let's say you pace let's say you walk then you come back and then you immediately get triggered again 
Yep. Yep. So it's like, okay, well, now you just walk again. And it's like, well, now class is over because you've, you've incorporated it into your daydream. But all it took was for you to begin the class and for them to say an idea. There goes your, your class. Gone. Done. Donezo. Nothing. Exactly. And it's interesting as well that, um, you know, because with the um, with something like a, a fix from a cigarette or, you know, whatever substance it might be that, you know, someone feels drawn to, um, you know, there's very much a sense of, you know, you consume the thing, you're, you know, you, you, you have that sense of release and then you can get on with your day. Not to say, not to uncomplicate addiction at all, but um, I guess what I'm meaning mm -hmm. more is in the sense of that it's a very, like, it's a very physiological experience. Um, with daydreaming, you're also you're also in, in the process of creating a story. Um, so it's this never ending process of like not only are you feeling you, do you feel sort of compulsed to do it, but then the, the 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 story never ends. There's always something else to be refined or to be you know to be changed or to be looked at from another angle. And I don't know whether you guys find this for me. Um, you know, once I have been triggered by something, I get this sense that it's almost a sense of duty. Like I feel yeah. like my characters are waiting for me to come along and resolve what needs resolving. Cause often I think a lot of the crux of a lot of my, of the, of the, the, the scenarios that play out in the world in my head is there's, there's a conflict to be resolved and it's the resolution. That's this, 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 this satisfying feeling that you get, you know, it's that sense of, you know, I've brought my characters through whatever suffering they need to go through. And I've been there with them through that and then you get this very um get this very cathartic resolution to that so there's a sense of mm -hmm. almost like i need to do this for my characters like they're stuck until i come along and like tie these loose threads together and that, that's often been i think the thinking that's led me to fall i guess fall down the rabbit hole again you, uh, you you're gonna you you get into a daydream and you're like wow that was cool all right once again from the top with feeling yes yep, yep. yeah it, you just do it over and over because you'll <laughs> you'll go through the scenario and you'll come to a resolution and say that's not it that's not enough yeah. they deserve better right since it's such an obligation for us it's they it's like you walk through mm -hmm. the door and they're waiting for you they're your friends and how 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 uh, tied to them you are depends on the person. I'm sure a lot of us can sympathize with them being, they're, they're the closest thing to you, right? So you, as yeah. you said it yourself, you're obligated to, to, to give them what they deserve. Because we can, most people can just go around and generate their mm -hmm. story by just walking around and experiencing things, but our characters can't. We mm -hmm. need to do this for them. And then if you come to a, a point where your scenario is not your, your conclusion, your resolution isn't quite good enough. I'm sure there's plenty of perfectionists out there who say, man, you know, this character could have could have had so much more by the end of that. So we're going to do that again with everyone yep. here. That was spectacular. But now we're going to do it again. And since you all deserve better, we're going to go a second time and then a third and then a fourth, a yep. fifth, a sixth until you get exactly what you feel is good enough. We should just do a whole uh, episode on loops. Loops are a bitch. Because <laughs> I was going to add that once you get it perfect, then you want to do it again because it's so satisfying. <laughs> so like, you can't stop. It's a never-ending story. It, it never ends. Nope. And it just keeps going and going and going. I think Meg... Uh brought up a really um, interesting point about like a, a, a duty towards um, characters because a trigger never happens. Well, not never, but <laughs> I feel like they don't usually happen in a vacuum. You know what I mean? Because you have, you know, whatever the catalyst was and all the uh, um, urges that come with that. And one of them definitely is like the emotional connection that we have to our worlds, pushing us into it, even on top of whatever physical urges we're feeling, there's definitely an emotional draw there because I don't know. Cause you, the feelings are, are real. We know our worlds aren't real, but we really do feel for them. Yeah. Cause, cause in a way, in a way, the characters kind of are you, you know? So I think, I think that might be part of why we feel a duty to, you know, 
to interact with these characters and to like develop them because they kind of are us, you know, and mm -hmm. um, with with a lot of my um, stories and stuff, they have they have a kind of parallel to things that are going on in my personal life. Um, like uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to mention anything like specific, but um, just I guess like challenges that I have to overcome or um, I guess important things that I think are important that, you know, I can't really tell anyone or can't really explain to people you know or things that i don't know how to work mm -hmm. through um as i guess me but if i'm this other character or like if i you know write about it and you know think about it maybe i could learn it's like a weird almost it's like a dissociation almost like i'm working through these problems like through other characters um because you've kind of split a portion of yourself off and, and caused, like, yeah. now have developed yeah, a character as that small portion of you. Exactly. Oh, and here's a fun one, right? So you take all of these portions of you and then you split them apart and have them interact with each other and interact with these situations that are born from what you yourself have experienced, right? And exactly. as they grow, as they grow, you grow too. And I, I think something that is not often t said or told is that you become the uh, product of what your characters have gone through, right? Mm -hmm. I think when I was younger, I would be thrust into scenarios where I didn't have anybody. There was nowhere I could tar turn to. So, because if I were put in that scenario, what would I do? It's one of these things where, that's why I th uh, I've become a rather serious person. Um, and because of a lot of my characters have gone through scenarios like that, and it's, it's... and so that's an example of me. I'm sure uh, everyone here has had their own their own characters go through uh, situations which then bounce back and then influence what you do in the future, right? But if you have that happen to characters long enough and over time, then you yourself, when put in a situation like that, begin to say, okay, I have nowhere to turn to. Now I'm going to need to do X, Y, and Z because it worked for my characters, uh, mm -hmm. theoretically. So you apply what they did to your daily life and then whatever happens to you after making that decision, you then reincorporate into your world, and then it feeds. It's it's a back and forth, right? I'm really intrigued by this idea that you kind of that we can kind of grow alongside our characters. That sort of the way that our characters develop influences how we develop as people. Um, I think you could also make an argument for the inverse that as we, we our, our characters mature yeah. alongside how we mature right in the sense that like i know that for me the my my characters just general opinions uh like world views taste in things interests like they've all they've all evolved alongside my own um so it's it's very interesting i think because it's it's such a complicated relationship we can have with this this sense of development you know it, it, at what point I, I suppose what I'm trying to say is like it would be interesting to know like how how our attitudes flip like when we feel like it's more of our characters that are in control of our development or whether it's us in control of our development which then influences the characters I can imagine I know for me I would go through phases of that of yeah. feeling like sometimes it's more the characters in control and sometimes it's more me if that makes sense I think this topic um, and the tangent that we went on a little bit there about how our relationships and stuff develop over time with our daydream world or whatever um, uh, leads into a, a, an, an audience question from um, Halo, actually, popped it in the chat. Um, have your triggers changed over time as you've grown, as your needs have changed, um, and, you know, anything like that? So I've been quite keen to discuss this with people because I, I, I have had quite a specific experience in this regard and I'm really I've, I've not had much of a chance to bounce it off of many people um so yeah I'm very interested to know if you guys have had similar experiences so for, for me myself my daydreams have always been grounded in a in a fictional universe that already exists so um um my I think my second one was based in the, the Doctor Who universe for any any Doctor Who fans um and I've had a couple of others since so it's always been it's always sort of been based in um um yeah these these this, uh, with characters that are 
normally pre-established with then some other characters that I've created myself and also in an, in, an environment that's already been created that there's, there is content out there for. Um, and my, in terms of how mine has changed, um, I've, what I've started to notice, I guess, up to this point in my life being um, 25 now is I, te- I seem to go through what, what appear to be sort of 12 year cycles. And it's at that point that my universe tends to change. So for, for sort of my childhood, I had a very specific universe that that my daydreams existed in. And when I was 12, that did quite a big change to then another universe, which then sort of served me, I suppose, until my early 20s. And then very recently, I discovered something new that I've been consuming quite regularly that has become the new basis for this for this for, for for my own paracosm at the moment and I assume we'll stay that way for for a good few years until I find something else um so in that sense I've I've that sort of been my experience of that and I think we've we've already you know we've already just discussed before about how you know the the our characters you know kind of develop along with our own tastes and our own worldviews so in that sense I've definitely had that experience but yeah in terms of I guess the 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 uh the structure of my of my daydreaming world is there's definitely been sort of two very big switches um sort of as my needs have changed I suppose and they've mostly been to do with the universe that the daydreams actually sit in so I don't know if people have had similar experiences it's not something I've really heard about from other people but I'd be keen to know I'm so old (laughs) I don't think you're old (laughs) Well, thank you. But uh, I just bring that up to say, like, yes, like I've, I have the amount of hindsight it takes to see trends like that. And um, I have, I've always had the same world. I do not switch worlds, but there have been massive shifts in, uh, you know, when I was a child, it was kid heroes. And then it was like a Battlestar Galactica kind of um, caravan for years. And, and now it's in like a settlement process. They found a new home. Um. I didn't notice, though, with mine, that my external triggers changed along with those massive theme changes, though. I I think my triggers have stayed the same, but I'm wondering if it's the same experience for you, Meg. Do you still have the same triggers, or have they changed with the theme shift? Well, I guess this is one thing I I, I didn't mention at the beginning when we were talking about what our triggers are. I I think because my because my daydreams are based in a universe that has already been created outside of my own head, one of my strongest triggers is any content to do with that particular universe. So in that sense, yes, like the because it means that my main trigger is very much influenced by what I'm consuming. So now, you know, I mentioned Doctor Who. If I were to, if I were to read or watch any Doctor Who content, it probably wouldn't trigger me the same way unless you know, there was a particularly emotive moment that I wanted to sort of then transfer into into my own daydreams. But now if I were to sort of consume something that's set in my current universe, then yes, it would be immediate. And I very much have to keep away. That makes sense. And is so obvious now that you say it, <laughs> I guess, because I don't uh, daydream with fictional um, pre-existing fiction. I don't, didn't think of that. No, and I, I realise as well, I didn't actually, I didn't link it back to triggers when I made the initial comment, which I should have done. So it, um, I um, uh, I appreciate that wasn't very clear, but um, yeah, that is, it's definitely, it's definitely the main thing. I have noticed um, a slight change in my triggers over time. Um, it, it, it's a little bit complicated in that I think there are two main underlying, I guess, components that don't change um movement and music are always a trigger um learning new information or like you know like some kind of new idea that appears is also always a trigger um no matter what basically but i've noticed that my um i'm trying to find the words for it the the way that it manifests has changed over time a little bit um as a kid um I used to pace, and then I kind of stopped pacing, and I went on the swings, and I would swing um, on the swings a lot, and that, that was how I would daydream. And then, basically, the way that, the way that I can um, describe it is that my triggers are very adaptable. I am very um, resourceful when it comes to 
the things around me like i will i'll do anything to be able to daydream um because after after i i couldn't get access to swings anymore i would go on my bike and i would just i would bike all all day or whatever for hours but but yeah so it would go from bikes to scooters to the swing um and then back to pacing and all these other things Sorry, I'm having I'm having a thought. Um, so, um, uh, pacing and music has um, come up a few times, uh, and I think that's natural for a conversation like this. But I am wondering, would you guys consider the pacing and the music as triggers or as facilitators? They are a consequence of being triggered. I, I would say both because if um so for example riding in a car um I don't I don't like ask to get in the car and go for a drive to daydream um but whenever I am in the car I will kind of inevitably slip into it it's almost um it's almost a uh, Pavlovian a little bit you know like if you if you ring the bell even if there's no food you know the dog will like expect food i guess so i think if i'm doing like even if i like go for a run or a walk and stuff with my family like we have dogs so we walk the dogs and stuff even if even just on a walk i'm not trying to daydream but the movement itself is kind of a it has become a trigger either you know either just from being from doing this for like 20 years or something or um because there's some kind of integral connection to it i'm not sure but i would say both there's like a weird there's a weird connection there i guess it does offer up a good um a good way to sort of start thinking about how different types of triggers can be categorized isn't it because i think it's almost like some things offer fuel and inspiration for whatever it is you're creating you know, I feel like that's very true for music, where you can create or recreate a very specific kind of emotion. Um, and the same with scenes from films um, or, um, mm -hmm. you know, things that we've been told in a lecture or at school that, that give us inspiration. Um, you know, that seems to be one thing that can lure us in. But then there are other things which and I think um, I think things like pacing, being on a long journey um, those kind of things are, are more ways of setting setting the stage almost like they they give you the opportunity to start to, to to sort of get that creative and imaginative energy going and it puts you in a position where you want to be doing stuff like that so i i think both are both kinds of triggers but they just i think they they serve slightly different purposes and it varies, obviously, depending on the person. But sometimes, some like in a lot of cases, when I was younger, right, like as a as a trigger, uh, my my intense loneliness was the was the trigger. And if I didn't, I I just could not get friends because everyone around me was not they were not very cooperative. So I said, okay, whenever I felt extremely lonely, then that is the trigger would say, okay, now it's time to daydream. I was always uh, my own character, so I would always, if I was lonely, I would go to my friends, and I think I had six of them at around this time, and they switched up who they were, but there was always around six. Um, but then later on, now that I have friends uh, of varying degrees, acquaintances, friends, now my uh, my paracosm, my world is now very, it's, my, my world is now larger, and recently has been getting much larger and expanding at a very large rate, but I think that's because my triggers are now more grand in scope rather than uh, it's like my small little pawn that I used to have, right? If that makes sense, right? Rather than a pawn, now I'm, I'm dealing with a sea or an ocean or a lake that is now turning into a, an ocean. Um, it grows bigger every day, if that makes sense. Um, so do any of you have any tips or advice on how to handle the triggers while you're supposed to do a task? Like, let's say if you are supposed to be studying or you're supposed to be working and you suddenly hear music and then the daydreaming starts. Like, do you have any tips or advice on how to deal with that? Mm -hmm. um, I think for me specifically, 
when it comes down to, at least now, with my characters going through a scenario, I often tell them as the director, and I'm supposed to be doing something, I say, all right, guys, we're going to take five, and we'll come back soon. Uh, I know we're here, uh, but if I if I know I'm supposed to be doing something else, I also know that uh, as I'm going through the scenario, it's not going to be perfect, so I'll just go from the top again. So I'm going to say, all right, this isn't quite working, guys. I find a, a, a stopping point to where I tell my, uh, I guess, actors, because I used to do theater, I tell them, I say, all right, take in five, we'll come back in five, and then we'll we'll uh, we'll continue on from there. I think it's a good way because you're not just actively leaving the room as the director and they're continuing onwards. You tell them, you tell your characters that we got we got things to do. We'll be right back. And you say we'll be back after this commercial break, right? It sort of it it, it ties you to your care or it ties me to my characters and telling them it's not like a direct no. I I absolutely love that and I couldn't agree more. Like I think. I think being being dynamic with it is such a is such a good way to um I think well like you were saying maintain a healthy relationship with your characters <laughs> in a way <laughs> because it, it, I I've I've definitely found in my own experience that it doesn't help to be hostile to the impulse it just doesn't work because you end up hurting yourself you end up you know probably end up daydreaming more because you've not given it the spe- you've not given the impulse space to because either way the impulse is there and i think you need to be i think it's it's important to be healthily aware of that i suppose and and i think do, like you no, know it's like trying to quit a habit cold turkey it's 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 not it's not the easiest it's not the greatest and you'll certainly suffer for it yeah yeah, definitely. And and I, I like that I like that active approach where you're kind of like having a conversation. Like, you know, if 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 the if the trigger has I know for me, like a lot of my a lot of my daydreams are, are sort of one on one conversations. So, you know, if that's the case, if you've been if you've if you've been exposed to a trigger and you feel yourself entering into that, um, like Dr. Q was saying, just having a conversation with that character and being like I'm really sorry. This isn't the time right now. I've got to finish this essay. I've got to read this book. I'll come back at five and we can have a chat. Like it, it I think it can feel a bit odd, but it, I think that dynamic approach is, it, it, I think it helps relieve some of those feelings of anxiety of being kind of ripped away from, from that space you want to be in. Mm-hmm. I think, I think one of the big things is, um, try like you 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 brainstorm solutions to your problems and then rather than saying that's just not going to work you might try to adapt it I think just trying things until you find something that works for you because everyone's different we might a lot of us might tend to pace a lot of us might might fall into music but there's a I, I believe there is an answer that works for everyone right you there is a solution there you just got to find out which one works for you and just try things over time and just on the back of that as well, you know, I think we're we're such changeable creatures, aren't we? And I think it's it's important to bear in mind that something that might that doesn't work for you right now might not work for you in the future. You know, it, it, I think these things are so in like are so influenced by you know the kind of mood that we're in, like the, the or wider than a mood, the, the the phase of life that we're in as well. So I guess in that sense, it's always um, it's always important to be a bit. Um, to use that word dynamic again i guess always to be open to the fact that you know it might work <laughs> that that technique might work next week when you're feeling a little less whatever you're feeling right now if that makes sense and um i think one more i guess um thing that can help people with the triggers is um i've noticed with a lot of people not not everybody i don't think but with quite a few people there is a social aspect to um stopping the daydreaming or to or at least suppressing it for a little while so i think maybe um like for example when when you're talking with people or spending time with people it's a lot harder to slip away into that headspace i mean sometimes you still do of course but um i think it being around other people being in a public or social setting can also help um prevent those triggers because you're we're with people you know it, there's something about the having real people around that helps to suppress that yeah i couldn't agree more and i think as well um 
uh, I don't know whether you guys would agree with this, but I know for me, I um, I think I felt a lot more, not all of the time, but significantly more in control once I was able to articulate what was going on in in my experience. And I think I I don't think I was I even started that journey until my early twenties before I could even talk about daydreaming. Um, so I, I guess just to encourage anyone that's listening, you know, obviously being on this forum and listening to this podcast, you are, you know, you're, you're some way along that journey. And I think starting that process of being able to talk about how you daydream and what that means for you. Um, I think that has an, a very, a very big impact on how you then manage that in your daily life. So I guess it's kind of a little clap for anyone listening because, you know, it's, you're already on that journey. Uh, that's it for this episode. Uh, next time we'll be talking about maladaptive daydreaming and our daily lived lives. So join us for that first and 16th of every month. Uh, if you want to be on the podcast or want to listen in in the audience and uh, send questions to the podcast while we're talking, you can join the Discord. I think we'll be in the description below. Yeah. <laughs> Be sure to click the like button, bing that bell, and <laughs> I we could just have guests do the outro all the time. <laughs> <laughs> do what they said. Like and subscribe, folks. What else are we gonna put in the description? We have the Discord server. We have the uh, the Reddit. Thanks to the uh, the Discord, the sub, a couple of other communities, uh, and a, and a few a few resources down in the description of every video. Perhaps we could put a link to a, a cat picture, something similar. And then one random cat. 